Okay, I'm recording. Hello. Hi. We're back. We're back. Hey, Anna. Hi. Another day in the neoliberal war room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how um, how have you been? Um, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a little depressed about the geopolitical situation and the mm. domestic situation. Yeah. Things seem especially bleak. There's a, a new chapter in the. <laughs> Israel-Palestine conflict. It's really getting you down. Yeah, and uh, gas prices are at an all-time high. Is that uh, true? Um, I think they're a, a, they're at an all-time high, um, a seven-year high. Okay. So, like, even our crises have kind of a capitalist realism, nostalgia revival edge right. to them. Yeah. We can't even have any cool new novelty crises. <laughs> We're literally back to. Israel, Palestine, and gas prices spiking. We're stuck in a in a feedback loop. Yeah, a Fisherian feedback loop. But well, at least this time it's being sort of like amplified through social media activism. Yeah, and there's tons of infographics to look at. Uh huh. <laughs> and people are really speaking out about it much more than they have in the past. Yeah, the digital intifada. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, I don't know if this is, that that's going to change anything for the better. Probably not. Well, Andrew Yang, um, made a statement in support of Israel yeah. and then he was confronted by some activists uh-huh. and then he said that actually, you know, it's complicated and both sides are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He said something totally meaningless instead and apologized. So yeah, yeah, I've had some impact, you know, on forcing Yang into taking a totally like lukewarm, pointless position. Yeah, I mean, the, he yeah he fight. he followed up one like boilerplate stock position with another one, and I, I like Glenn's article today about um, AOC kind of condemning, chastising Andrew Yang, mm-hmm. who's relatively powerless uh, in all of this, while not pushing back against the powerful Democrats Mm -hmm. um, that actually have some influence over. And who are vocal supporters of of Israel. Israel, Yeah. Biden, all of them. Yeah. So that I really recommend that article. It's on his sub stack, obviously. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm both an anti-Semite and an Islamophobe. So I figured I'd (laughs) split the difference. (laughs) A no state solution. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i mean instinctively i'm pro-palestine yeah i think it's obviously but i have no like i personally don't care if israel exists because i'm not jewish yeah so i really obviously i you know it's not complicated for me to be pro-palestine but if i really cared about israel then my yeah. position would be different yeah that's a that's a fair <laughs> position to have that's you know but it what from where i'm sitting it does seem like um an apartheid state well yeah i mean completely doing ethnic cleansing and they totally shouldn't be over there because (laughs) palestine was there first well yeah i mean the kind of situation in the settlements is like outrageous Mm -hmm. um i to quote the late great Muammar Gaddafi, mm. I cannot recognize either the Palestinian state nor the Israeli state. Palestinians are idiots and Israelis are idiots. <laughs> I was Googling Gaddafi today because I'm a big fan of his fashion sense. <laughs> he's my number one. Yeah, he's um, on your spring um, lookbook. Yeah. Mood board. Um, but I, I feel like um, this conflict, as someone said recently, um, has has already been settled and like not in favor of the Palestinians, you know, Mm -hmm. unfortunately Mm -hmm. like Israel is so powerful and so mighty and so bloated with American taxpayer (sighs) money. Um, Well, that's why when Israelis like Gal Gadot make like weepy weird text posts about how they just want like peace and for the conflict to stop, it's like what they want is, for there to not be any Palestinians like that. <laughs> yeah, they want it to be out of sight, out of mind. They would, would love to exterminate Palestine so that there could be peace. Yes. You know, it's not like they're really advocating for both sides at all. Yeah, so they take a sip of their latte and engage in some good old-fashioned both-sidism. It's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really despicable. I mean, and the Palestinians are going to continue to be 
uh, backed into a corner, stopping short of outright genocide because that's bad for optics. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of like, uh, you know, uh, effectively, like functionally, a genocidal policy. Ugh, um, why? And to me, and the issue with this, I th- I said I wasn't going to say anything, but okay. okay, the issue, the issue for me, the biggest issue is that. Um, Israel continues to pretend it's the victim when it's really the aggressor like that to me that's exactly what I said earlier today <laughs> it would be it would be They're the ultimate aggressors masquerading as, yeah as victims yeah how Jewish of them just kidding <laughs> um, no but like it would be honestly it wouldn't make it any better but it would be much more honorable and honest if they just came out with it and were just like we hate these people we don't think that they have a claim to this land uh, and let alone should exist and we're gonna pulverize them into oblivion if they just like stop doing this like but they're throwing they're rocks attacking you know. us. yeah and i know right. i understand the palestinians are like deploying rockets against israel's like well, Israel high-tech iron, state-of-the-art yeah dome. yeah um yeah as do i um. <laughs> that's why i have a zionist boyfriend uh <laughs> Sorry. just doing I mean, some shitty borscht belt humor yeah i don't like that i just find it dishonest and gross like every mainstream news network and every kind of establishment politician being like well we have to broker mm-hmm. like a two-sided piece because you know israel innocent yeah. civilians they're the victim too i read the new york times thing that was doing very both sides which was that I don't know, just with the one that I read when I Googled <laughs> Israel to like see what was going on. And then I looked at a bunch of infographics, yeah. as I said, and then I like, that's how I cooked up my, my perspective yeah. on the situation. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I agree with you. I am marginally Jewish and I don't know. Have you ever been to Israel? No, my sister has. Cause you know, the Jews, they go to Israel and they like, and tell them all this propaganda yeah you know and they so they're very attached to it and they like love it and feel like it's their their homeland right yeah my sister at the um when we were you know young in our 20 in our early 20s she did birthright i refused to do birthright because i you were doing bds i was doing bds um (laughs) i was because you know i feigned moral outrage at the Mm -hmm. plight of the palestinians but really i didn't want to leave my pakistani boyfriend that my grandparents thought was palestinian so i didn't go to birthright um and i I don't really regret it or not regret it either way nice yeah there i mean like a great way to meet guys (laughs) just kidding (laughs) um but yeah no israel's just acting like a bpd art ho like cooking up all these allegations (laughs) When they're actually the ones sending like the completely yeah aggressive signals, and yeah that that's very frustrating because it, you know the Israel is supposed to be the land not only of Jews but of Jews who uh, uncucked themselves and became openly aggro and militaristic, and they have to like right do it's this not like very Jewish damage, to, yeah to have a homeland. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think what makes the Jews the Jews is uh, their rootless cosmopolitanism. Exactly. Yeah. That's what's so great about them. Yeah. And if they, they want to have a homeland, I think like Miami is a perfectly great one. As I've said many times, they're going to have to fight with the uh, Cubans mm-hmm. for that stretch of land. But the Cubans are notoriously pro-Israel. So I think it, it could work out in the end. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think like... The other thing that repulses me, of course, is like the moral posturing from the American left, especially American Jewish leftists who are like out there giving themselves like a second circumcision, you know, (laughs) to to play up to people who would like put their head on a spike. And I'm not I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about like progressives. (laughs) And uh, I mean, they feel I don't know. I feel like I, they feel implored to say something. You well, know? yeah, I will say that there's, I think it it's very powerful when Jews speak out against the state of Israel because I think it pushes back on 
this very insidious myth that any critique of Israel is is anti-Semitic, that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. We all know that's not true, even me. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) I just, I don't like, you know, I think you can do that in a less self-abnegating and self-effacing way. Like you don't have to pander to people. And I think like it's actually more powerful if you say, if you come from a place of pride and dignity. Hmm. And I think, like, you know, American leftist Jews should have some pride and dignity. The Palestinians sure do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a minor issue, I think, in the larger scope of things. Of course, yeah. And I think the Palestinians will persevere at the end, even um, at they a great will. cost. They're I think so brave and strong, truly. It's just that they... You They're know, very incredibly noble people well i don't even i don't know that even if they're noble i just think that they have the upper hand because you know um given their utter lack and their utter want presently they have something that israel will never have which is like a fear of god and a willingness to fight in the face of like insurmountable odds and you know no high-tech weapon system can possibly be a match for that even if it like burns them all to the ground i mean but i feel the same way about armenians versus azeris Mm -hmm. and like i'm you know again a marginal jew i have family in israel i don't think that israel should be destroyed or you know not destroyed uh, repossessed or whatever because again you but we have to deal with present conditions you know what i'm saying yeah it's sad it's shitty um but i feel like what can you do don't you think i don't know well that's the thing that's why the the moral posturing by the left bothers me because palestinians are like the trans black lives of geopolitics you know like it's it's, a conflict that doesn't really touch anybody outside of the totally legitimate reason that this is a lot of american taxpayer money is going to right funding we just gave them like apartheid email for covid relief or something yeah i mean it's outrageous and i think glenn is right in in pointing out the perverse and glaring reality that like um you know israelis are getting certain benefits on our dime that americans don't have Mm mm-hmm so yeah yeah right that's really bothersome Mm -hmm. why is israel so powerful of that i don't know i'm gonna have to watch a vox explainer (laughs) i'm gonna have to watch um (laughs) videos on the on the dark web to (laughs) to get to the bottom of that one yeah but yeah, uh, no, I anyway. Mean, yeah, I will say we weren't gonna get into it. Yeah, we were gonna just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I will, I will say that I think Israel's treatment of the Palestinians is a is a great stain mm-hmm. on the Jewish people, and um, Israel's failure to recognize the Armenians is a lesser stain, but also a substantial one. Amen. So Jews d- do better, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I I second that for sure. Do better. Um, Anyway. Sorry. So we're drinking wine. I'm drinking more wine because I'm almost stressed out. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Wait, why are you stressed out? No, I'm not. It's just, it is, it's, it is stressful. The like, all the rockets and the horrible warfare and everything. Yeah, no, it's really depressing. Yeah. It is incredibly depressing. Yeah. Um, I have like some minor personal stake in it and I guess it makes me feel really down. Not as down as the car box stuff, but still it's, you know, shitty mm-hmm. to wake up to. Um, so yeah, I guess we can move on to mm-hmm. some, some lighter fare. Right. Unless you have. No, you know, no, no, please. What else is on the docket today? Well, in heavier fare. Yeah. There was an article. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see what you did there. There was an article in the LA Times about um, called Fat Shaming, BMI, and Alienation. COVID-19 brought new stigma to large-sized people, uh-huh. which was about the burgeoning fat acceptance movement, sort yeah. of being at odds with a lot of the 
scientific and medical research done around obesity being a disease and COVID-19 specifically just wreaking havoc on the bodies of yeah. obese people. Yeah. Um, what did you think of that article? <laughs> I don't know. I sent you that sentence. I'll yeah. pull up that sentence that I just thought like, again, my new tip is, is, um, mm. interpreting things that would ordinarily like be alarming or outraging as conceptual art. Yeah. You've got like a sort of a distance to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very Zen right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, like all Jews, I'm going to become a Buddhist to expiate my guilt <laughs> for all the people I fucked over. Um, the sentence um, was like really incredible. Um, Osborne is just the second black person to head NAAFA in the group's 52 year history. The organization was founded by a straight white man angry about how his large bodied Jewish wife was <laughs> treated because of her size. Yes. That sentence felt a little anti Semitic because, like, what does her being Jewish have to do with anything? <laughs> well, it's saying that, you know, there haven't been a lot of people of color yeah at the national association to advance fat acceptance is what the that's the name of the organization that's, that's really funny NAFA too. Stands yeah. for. um <laughs> i just like every time i read one of these sentences i just like picture like will ferrell parachuting in and do it's like a skit you know right <laughs> and there's another one um called the fat legal advocacy rights and education project which is flair for short which is really on brand because uh obesity is chronic inflammation like literally like flaring up of, <laughs> sorry i mean yeah this article was it's true that fat people are discriminated against yeah 100 percent, and definitely they talk about various studies they had done showing that like um doctors are less enthusiastic about treating overweight people and that they sort of like look down on them for making like poor life choices yeah um people are fat for a variety of reasons Uh um that the doctors don't always take into account and you know yeah um yeah i would agree with that kind of the spin you know yeah a lot of fat activists which also i'm sorry imagine being a fat activist and not just losing weight (laughs) like it seems much harder to be i mean i guess it's very like the barriers to entry to being an activist or like you or i could literally become like a frail activist or whatever i kind of feel like a frail activist (laughs) honestly because i all for all of this like body positivity yeah i feel like when i practice it i get called like uh, pro Anna or yeah. you know if I try to talk on my food Twitter about my <laughs> you know my weight or my lifestyle I get totally lambasted for for being pro anorexia yeah for stuff, glamorizing really, anorexia yeah. what about waif body positivity yeah especially in this like thick positive you know yeah in this if age anything, where anyone's identity goes exactly it's so hard to be thin and white with a large disposable income (laughs) well the uh the joke i texted you i'll just repeat it yeah just do it i said uh fat acceptance movement (laughs) (laughs) why didn't they why didn't they call it the bl (laughs) team i wish we had i wish we had like one of those like little drum trucks Uh, because they they'd be eating sandwiches yeah (laughs) Um, yeah i i mean yeah again this is one of those issues where like r- the radical activism is marching in lockstep with existing economic processes like you know you mm-hmm. don't you don't need a fat acceptance movement because 70 percent of american adults <laughs> as this article points out are already overweight or obese right like fat has been accepted but somehow they're still discriminated against as well a, as a majority yeah they're the silent they're like majority. Israel. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're like the Palestinians of America, fat people. Um, they're just herded into the Gaza Strip-like environment of a Popeyes. Um, right. 
But for them to take umbrage with like, I don't know, medicine. For yeah. Basically advising them to lose weight. Yeah. It's totally okay for all, for the rest of us to, to take umbrage and like not believe in vaccines <laughs> or anything. But when fat people do it, yeah, that really crosses the line for me. <laughs> I'm fully I got my second yeah. vax the other day by the way so we can't get deplatformed for being anti-vax no, no I'm not anti-vax also by the way if somebody held a gun to my head I would get the vax even if they just made your life marginally easier I bet you would get the vax yeah like if I was you know if I couldn't travel or exactly. something exactly I'd get if a hot Palestinian guy held a gun to my head if you had to get like a test if you had to get like tested before you boarded a plane and tested when you landed I bet you would just get the vax yeah of course I would <laughs> I'm not that high and mighty I'm just trying to I'm, I'm trying to like um uh kind of kick the can down the road as long as I can um, so that in the event that I have like Irish twins or something that, uh, I can avoid any issues, but whatever. I mean, you think it'll make you sterile? No, I don't think it'll make me sterile at all. I think like that's totally ridiculous and far fetched, but I think that there just like, there's so little information. There's about no the way effects. to know. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to know either. And I understand the flip side argument that there's also very little information, like long-term studies on COVID or whatever. Yeah. But so we probably weren't going to get COVID. Yeah. Or we got it already and it We're seems fine. fine. Yeah. yeah. No more, no less retarded than usual. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, it's true. Like fat. So these fat activists basically claim there's a bias among medical providers against overweight and obese people, which is true. Um, and they claim that it kind of skews the data on obesity and COVID, which may be true. But I think like the spin I would put on that is that the bias is not really um, again, it's not a moral one. It's an economic one because mm. these medical providers are part of the medical, the healthcare industry and they're just avoiding liability. They're minimizing liability. Right. Like they don't want to be sued. Right. And they don't want to have um, kind of like a, a, a preventable death on their hands. So they would rather just like not treat fat people mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, treat them and have them die on the table. Well, so the article ends with, this quote from this woman who um the, i'll just read it yeah. she put off being <laughs> vaccinated because she was terrified of leaving the apartment she has not taken public transportation in more than a year rideshare services are too expensive she does not drive no matter what she has gone to the doctor for she said her physician would prescribe the same thing weight loss she fears being diagnosed with COVID-19 and having to go to a hospital. Are they going to give me the same treatment as a skinny person or even a white person? Cruz asks, will they have things that accommodate me? A larger robe? Seats without arms? Will the bed be comfortable? These are the things we have to think about as larger people. The things she said that felt like, quote, a punishment for being fat. And that's incredibly sad. Yeah. And like, she clearly has developed some kind of like agoraphobia. Yeah. Also due to being obese. Yeah, well, as a fat person, you're punished twice. It's kind of like that line about... I mean, it's not a punishment. It's just, it's like when you deviate from the norm, yeah. you are punished by it, by like the circumstances of life, Yeah, you know? But also, and I mean... And to the doctors who continually prescribe her weight loss, even when they, you know, maybe they could be treating her for other things... I do think that they are doing their like due diligence as doctors and yeah. giving her sound medical advice. Yeah. I mean, unlike COVID or COVID vaccines or even birth control, I feel like there's plenty of evidence, uh -huh. well-documented evidence that being overweight does cause, you know, bodily inflammation and system failure. Mm -hmm. it, I'm sure that there are outliers of like overweight people who are healthy yeah, well, that's what the fat acceptance movement is sort of advocating for, is that yeah. you can be healthy at any size. Yeah, but you But I don't can't. think that's a you great can't. rule of thumb. Yeah, to, to organize. I don't think that's a good principle to be organizing around, personally. Yeah, and I think, like, yeah, the bigger issue is that, like, um, you know, I'm really, like, not interested in, like, fat shaming in terms of, like, frown, you know, looking down upon people for their personal choices. But... Of course, this not. is you know um, 
an epidemic of like late like imperial decadence Mm -hmm. it really is it's not good to have kind of a captive population of overweight people who are medical perma clients well yeah and i think like the covid thing is especially um it's also intersectional yeah because people in like poor communities don't often just don't have access to food yeah or healthcare or healthcare exactly yeah and i but it's you know i think the covid thing is especially disturbing because it's it's also created a a captive population of like agoraphobics essentially Mm -hmm. um and I, what was that statistic? I mean, I don't know how true any of these statistics are, but it was, I saw a statistic that something like 40% of millennials had put on weight mm-hmm. um, <gasps> during the, the, <laughs> the lockdowns. Yeah. I mean, that's horrifying. Well, how much weight? What does put on weight mean? Yeah, I mean, it depends on like, but I'm sure some people really kind of spiraled and it's not a negligible I mean, I lost, number. I lost weight. Good for you. Mm. <laughs> I just want to put on record that I would have lost weight if I hadn't gotten pregnant. <laughs> but I gained my, my 30 pounds, fair and square. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it just... That's like... You, you know, I'm very proud of you. I think you're a brave um, intifada jihadi against <laughs> the obesity I epidemic. didn't mean to... I mean, I lost too much weight at a certain point. Like last summer, <laughs> yeah. I think I was really looking like gaunt. It was the stress, truly. Really. Yeah, I wasn't it was like, like yeah. I wasn't like trying to lose weight. And be careful. You're gonna piss so many people well, off. Gonna- <laughs> no, I believe like, <laughs> I might be like Liz Brunig talking yeah. about how she's happy she had a baby. Yeah. I mean it's it's not I don't know. Like she just like lost weight casually without even trying. It's not casual. It's like I get get anxious and then like my throat closes up and then I don't feel like eating. Yeah. And I, like tweak out all day and like it's not health. I'm not like bragging. I'm really not bragging. <laughs> well, the, you know, winning the genetic lottery really comes down to um, the question of whether you're one of those people who eats when they're stressed versus one of those people who loses Starves their appetite. When they're yeah. Stressed. yeah. Yeah. And if you're the latter, it's smooth sailing because you can't, you know, you don't it, technically it's not an eating disorder. So people can't I come mean, down on not. you for that. Yeah. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not anorexic. I want to be like healthy and hot. Yeah. And, like, maybe a little tiny bit underweight. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a little bit, you know? Yeah. Like how, <laughs> like what's a little bit like 10%? Um, I think, I think being a little underweight is probably like, I should be 115. I like to be like 110. Yeah. Okay. You know, and I then 113, you. 113, you know, just like 110 yeah. to 115. I like to have yeah, be the like sweet in spot. that zone. Yeah whatever <laughs> <laughs> i think this is a perfectly acceptable I didn't way mean to for, make this about no me. it's fine it's a perfectly acceptable way i think like american for my also, body type like, yeah yeah you're very I have small a slender boned yeah like like a bird like yeah I, <laughs> yeah um i'm medium boned and i like to be around that weight too and it's like i think the american kind of bmi tables are a little skewed in the caloric tables they're skewed all over the place yeah. too yeah um, but no, I feel, I feel for obese people. I feel for all people, believe it, it or not, including awful. Palestinians, mm-hmm. um, because it, it is an awful situation and it, it's probably a very frightening and anxiety inducing situation to like not be able to move around, no pun intended, because you might be at a higher risk mm-hmm. for like complications from COVID, um, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, and this people is, treat you with contempt because yeah, people do. Yeah, I think I know? think people do. I think people really do hate fat people. Not as much as fat people hate themselves, by the way, but they do. <laughs> um, but again, I, I will maintain. I don't, that, for the record. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate anybody. It takes too much energy, and I don't really have those calories to expend. But um, the I think that like the healthcare industry again, it's really not about personal animus or personal hatred. It's about um, you know, again, minimizing liability, maximizing profit. Right. A doctor has to tell you to lose weight. That's his job. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, it's like when you go to the doctor, yeah, there's like a protocol of things that they do that how they tell you to quit smoking. Yeah. Always. Even though they know it's really cool and I only do it sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) Or like get the flu vaccine. There's like, you know, some certain talking points that they have to hit with you. Yeah. That's like that that are basically unexamined at this point, you know, 
because everybody's been doing it for so long. But like, you know, an interesting story about <laughs> speaking of vaccines is, um, you know, when I had my baby, bless you, and Sorry. I was in the hospital, they kept pushing a hep B vaccine, which I thought was a little weird and suspect because he was so young and it seems weird to, you know, prick a tiny arm like that. And so I opted to do it like at the two month mark when it's standard, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and they were very pushy about it. And I kind of did some research and asked my pediatrician and my midwives who were affiliated with a different hospital why that was. And it turns out that there was one case in New York City, or maybe it was in New York State, of a woman who was a hep B um, sufferer and she transmitted it to her kid. Uh, So they're covering their asses, basically, because they don't want another situation like that. But it's not because it's medically necessary for, you know, a day old child to get a vaccine. Wouldn't they have just, shouldn't they just test you for happy? Yeah, I don't know. But I yet. guess you could like pick it up. Yeah, I mean, but it's a weird, you know, I think like medicine in general. Uh, in Yeah, no in one America, likes going to the doctor. Yeah. And even if you can fit in the seats. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And also the beds are never comfortable, even if you're skinny. <laughs> um, but yeah, surely like air travel as well. It must be hell if you're, you know. Yeah. And but that's deviation from a norm like yeah but there's only so much accommodating we can sort of do there's just only so much real estate in the united states (laughs) it's new york city baby you don't have the (laughs) you better slim down because we don't have the room (laughs) but as far as i'm concerned this is like a healthcare crisis right no absolutely i don't think like you know it's horrible that we have a population of overweight and obese people not because they're horrible people, but because their health outcomes are mm-hmm. worse on the whole. Yeah. That's ridiculous. I know. Anyway, but I, I guess, yeah, my, I don't know, the I take some umbrage with um, radicals and activists trying to t- turn this into like a woke issue. Right. Making so, it, I mean, it's incredibly narcissistic. It's It's all about sort of their feelings about experiencing fat phobia yeah rather than like the material reality of being fat in the in the world and like biologically yeah i mean i think this is really what happens when kind of like social and political issues become like questions of morality rather than questions of like material factors like uh economics or like health or something like that so it becomes a question of like you know your personal moral standing on an issue and well the language policing of like piecing person of size or like large sized person yeah seems like that's like a joke yeah you know well if you have an issue with the word fat to me, fat is also, it's it's descriptive. It's a neutral word. It's yeah. a neutral word. And if you have a problem being called fat, it's because of your own internalized fat phobia. Yeah. Your own like fragile ego. I mean, it's weird. I Like there's, it, it is like a purely, purely descriptive word. Um, but the seeing that, you know, like we kind of like uh, unquestioning, unquestioningly accept terms like, people of color which sound always to me a little bit off and bland and bureaucratic yeah definitely um but because we're talking about kind of like a racial category and not like a physical one Mm -hmm. um you know we kind of accept them but it but uh words like large sized person or person of size (laughs) really make you realize how bizarre and deranged this language (laughs) is i know i'm serious no i know and like how much you're willing to adapt and assimilate totally pathological like language. Yeah. And the scary thing about that, I think is, um, you know, it seems comical and absurd to us now. And you think like, Oh, it'll never stick. But I feel like whatever the crazy trend is right now will be the, the norm, you know, five years from now. You think you think fat phobia is going to take off? Well, I don't, I don't know. So. Spe- I don't know specifically like that issue, but a lot of like crazy shit that's going on right now that we are like, oh well, it's confined to the campus or it's confined to Twitter. I think really will spill you over. Think? Yeah, I think it'll become a sorting mechanism 
to mm. to really kind of sort the elites and the pro- proles like the deplorables totally mm. i mean that's my feeling about it like uh I won't get into it because it's like a boring topic, but I think it'll like really kind of like it'll create a moral wedge between kind of the overclass and the underclass. I, my feeling on it is that they'll, that as these sort of things begin to spill out of Twitter, they'll become increasingly sort of incoherent yeah i mean a large i mean most people i think if you polled most people fat people included who weren't on social media and were like what do you think about the term person of size they would laugh laugh at you yeah of course like if you ask them like fat italian or fat black guy (laughs) like a new yorker what Mm -hmm. they thought as they were coming out of their favorite like sub spot (laughs) they would laugh at you yeah I mean, it's also incredibly f- feminized. Yeah, the fat acceptance movement. It's like obviously, fat guys are not. Yeah, are not spearheading these no. programs and campaigns. It's That's all, true, except for that guy who has a fat Jewish wife. Yeah, I guess. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, and we thought curvy was quaint. Remember when fat people were jumping on the curvy bandwagon? Let's, in curvy mass? should come back. Yeah, but it should refer to women Curvy of all sizes sense. who have an extreme hourglass shape, not apple-shaped people who are waist to hip. Oh, yeah, waist to hip race. That's like, like Billie Eilish is curvy. Not to go back to last week's. Topic. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. You bring up a really good point that this is just another. Um, expression of bpd society and that it's women leading the charge Mm -hmm. you know women are passionate about social justice that sort of thing yeah they they really are yeah and and marketing (laughs) yeah and shopping and photoshopping yeah (laughs) little fucking infographics (laughs) (laughs) oh god um speaking of overweight people should we talk about elon oh yeah right i forgot that that was on the docket yeah unfortunately i I watched it live on saturday night um and yeah it was on i mean i wasn't expecting it to be good Mm -hmm. and in a way it's a good kind of like death knell for snl Mm -hmm. that i'm uh little known fact on me i used to be really into snl when i was like a tween yeah me too (laughs) totally it was totally funny back then i like the will ferrell era was like major for me but i got into like i came to new york when i was like 13 and visited 30 rockefeller and i got a t-shirt that had the original cast on it and i like would read books about like snl history and i like had um pictures of like john belushi like in this like in my binder at school and stuff i like i've been a fan of saturday night live and i believe in it as like a cultural institution yeah it hasn't been funny obviously for a long long time yeah me too but do you have like um that kind of secret wish that it that you know given that things are cyclical that it might rebound maybe into a new golden age yeah or do you think it's like over and it's time we discard it no i don't think we can discard it you think it's here to stay like the israel palestine conflict it's just it's gonna it's institution yeah it's timeless you know it's gonna go on and it'll like kind of take form and maybe it'll become more reflective i mean it is reflective of the times in that it totally sucks yeah (laughs) it's true (laughs) you know but it's it's something that you've talked about before like how um under trump sort of our reality became uh increasingly hilarious Mm -hmm. and like avant-garde and aestheticized in this way that like surpassed contemporary art and comedy and like yeah these things that couldn't really like keep pace yeah they can't compete yeah what they're attempting to like satirize or whatever Uh uh-huh and having elon musk yeah who's just like i i was wondering i was thinking to myself if i like didn't like him and didn't respect him uh-huh. or if I didn't respect him, but liked him uh-huh. or if I, <laughs> or with the other variant of that. And I yeah. was like, oh, I guess I like, 
I totally don't respect him and think he sucks, but I kind of like him because he's such a like, I don't truly like him because he's like a devious, annoying, nerdy billionaire yeah. who like ins- inspires my most like bullish, bullying yeah. like instincts. But I kind of like him because he's like a stupid slob who like yeah. <laughs> has been hoisted onto the world stage or whatever. Yeah, he's he's innocent in a way because he's autistic. Yeah. Yeah, and him, his, like, Aspergy, them trying to kind of utilize his Aspergyness in the best way was a disaster yeah, him, to watch. Him reading awkwardly from the teleprompter, like, I'm making mm-hmm. history as the first person with Aspergers to host SNL, or at least the first person who admits they have Aspergers. I can't yeah. do a, I'm not going to do a South African it, accent. It's such, it's such a weird accent. It's I not even South African. The ac- Wait, what is it? I mean, it is, but yeah. it's, he's, the yeah. way he speaks is weirder than just that. Yeah. So they freaking, <laughs> freaking, I like, I hate, hate, hate his accent. I, his mom, his yeah. deranged blood sucking mother came out. And yeah. Like, his stage mom. So bizarre. Yeah. I found the whole cold open with everyone's moms to be unpleasant. Yeah, I I almost there was a brief moment where I I was watching this like in my like usual like sleep deprived range state, and there was like a moment where I thought that Elon and his mom were gonna French kiss <laughs> when they kind of went in for a hug, mm-hmm. and I was like, wait, that would be truly yeah. groundbreaking and avant garde. He can do that it. Would He's be autistic funny. and a billionaire. People would he should make yeah. out with his mom yeah. on, on TV. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, that would be funny. May, but you got to turn e. into Mad TV for that type of. Show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh God, I used to love Mad TV. Mad TV was yeah. was dope. Lowered expectations. Mm-hmm. Will Sasso, total one on the binary. I love that guy. Definitely. Aries Spears. Shout out Fat Acceptance. <laughs> yeah. <man>. Um. <laughs> no, I just here's the thing that I don't. I guess the thing that I don't get about Elon is why he's trying to be like a famous celebrity and like public figure that Mm -hmm. i don't understand because he's so rich like i thought like the whole point of being filthy rich is being able to opt out of uh being in the public eye it's because he's kind of stupid he doesn't realize that yeah he's like dumb he's fundamentally like a dumb slob he's a smart dumb guy exactly and joe rogan is a dumb smart guy i think switch it okay no, jogan jogan, jogan. <laughs> rogan is a smart dumb guy okay yeah okay that's yeah. Is that what you said I don't, yeah whatever yeah and elon is a dumb smart guy dumb yes, smart exactly. Guy, exactly yeah sorry yeah he's fundamentally kind of dumb yeah and he just like craves I, the, the disturbing thing for me is like one of the features of like modernity or whatever um is that like people have realized that money doesn't equal power on some level Mm. or like, because they have like, Oh, you know, it does equal power in the sense that you could, you know, um, crush your adversaries and stuff like that. But like, you know, people don't care about you if you're rich, unless you're also visible. There's things money can't buy. Yeah. And maybe goodwill is one of them because people really seem to hate elon musk yeah but on that level there's gonna like you're gonna have like half the people are gonna hate you and half the people are gonna think like you're dope you think people think he's dope yeah i'm sure some like troglodytes do some like stupid like tech bros totally think he's dope yeah maybe yeah i mean totally the other thing is i don't get how grimes suffers the massive humiliation of being because she's the baby. spurgy she, she's too also and just spurgy, doesn't yeah. understand. Yeah. They're not like, they don't have that intu- intuitive kind of taste thing. Yeah. But yeah, this was like this whole thing. And by the way, SNL sucks. So it's not, it, it wasn't at all Elon's fault mm-hmm. that this episode was as shitty and anticlimactic as all of the recent previous ones. Of course. Like he was just, you know, doing his job. But like, I I don't know like if, I, what he was hoping to accomplish with that. Like, kind of also laundering his reputation as like a um, positive and wholesome figure. 
Right. He doesn't strike me, you know, as particularly sinister either. He's like the picture of the banality of evil in a way, because exactly. there's nothing like overtly kind of like disturbing or nefarious about him yeah, in the way that just, there is with Jeff Bezos. He's kind of simple and like vacant. Exactly. Yeah. Which is not to say that he's not capable of like incredible machinations or whatever i do like the tesla i've sat in a tesla before it's you a very, have yeah it, it was like you a, like it i liked sitting in the tesla it was a little low to the ground but yeah i've been in one once i really didn't like it but it was probably my company oh yeah <laughs> am i allowed to ask it was who? some like financier oh, okay yeah <laughs> were you escorting no no no, <laughs> no not formally I'm not yeah. a prostitute. No, I know. For this. People give me shit for that too. It's what? For, <laughs> for having a high body count and like being a slut, whatever. It's 2021. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I've never had sex for money or like to curry personal favors or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I the people, again, like I've said it before and I'll say it again. People think they're mad at certain women for having sex or sucking dick or having babies or, or yeah <laughs> well we'll get to that um but th- they think that they're mad at you because you like sucked your sucked your way to the top <laughs> or whatever but really they're mad at you i mean th- this is like the thing with lana del rey right mm-hmm. it's like probably actually she didn't have to suck anybody off yeah i think she flirted with like the yeah. idea of it it's much more upsetting to learn that like people you hate didn't have to do sexual favors mm-hmm like once you know that they did right you you can dismiss them personal charm will take you far yeah you never like here's the thing that like feminists don't understand it's (laughs) very it's very good to have um kind of ostensible like whatever male superior is interested in you um you don't even have to fuck them you can just tease them a little yeah it really works it really does uh it makes everybody's life easier and more pleasurable (laughs) Anyway, should we talk about Bruyne Gate? Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on Saturday Night Live? Did you um, watch the Zoomer sketch? No, I watched. I watched the um, the Chad in Space sketch. Was that one of them? Uh, yeah, that was one of their like digital shorts. Yeah, with Pete Davidson. He was used very sparingly in a lot of like digital content. I uh-huh. think because they could really kind of rein him in and get him to all of like the the one note of elon's comedy was like awkward guy yeah he's like asperger and that's really all he can do yeah um so he was just a poor choice for a guest in that way i wouldn't have invited him on honestly but yeah it was the weird it, it sounds like they're like running out of options yeah maybe bono can host the I'll next do one it. yeah they they should just ask you I'll do it. i was I'll gonna ask funny. you if they given all the trash talk we've indulged in if they if snl came to you and asked me you know come on six months a year from now and they were like dasha would you would you host yeah yeah of course yeah of course it would be it would be awesome (laughs) i would be honored (laughs) i used to practice my snl monologue when i was like a little kid that's really cute in the mirror and stuff and it's been yeah i've like wanted to host us over a long time weirdly but i don't think i ever will though who knows if elon can never say never never say never yeah um and then oh yeah i watched the mario courtroom one yeah that one was really bad but i have to say he did a a, an adequate and passable italian accent so good for him he did okay yeah Yeah. yeah yeah I just, I don't know. I, I don't I know. I think I kind of laughed a couple of times during that one because like the ambient was hitting. Yeah. I, I may have too because that one was like, <laughs> it wasn't like punching up or down. It was like punching nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like it was like kind of untethered from reality and therefore it's like a decent skit, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Apparently his crypto tanked afterwards, his doge. Coin. Oh, yeah. I hated that joke that Mae Musk made about the Mother's Day gift being Dogecoin. Oh. Like all the jokes are so corny and predictable. It was almost like a Norm MacDonald monologue, mm-hmm. but like minus the ironic distance. I know. I really love Norm. Me we should too. actually get him on the Yeah, pod. we should ask him. He, he might he do it. He has nothing going on. He'd probably <laughs> do it. Yeah. He would have been a good guest for this one, but whatever. Yeah. He's probably not allowed to talk about his time on SNL. 
why not? He's, well, a, he's like a free agent. Allegedly, he was fired for making too many O.J. Simpson jokes. Oh, nice. Wait, that's really <laughs> hot. Yeah. I'll Learned. offer to suck him off. <laughs> <laughs> Live from New York. <laughs> it's Red Scare Podcast. I would love to do a live show. I, I Ordinarily, I'm not a fan of live shows because I'm like a shy and receding person, but... I, COVID has been so. I know we had we've had fun at the live yeah. shows. Um, maybe we will soon. Yeah, it would be I'm fun. Optimistic. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I enjoyed doing them. No, I know, but you're like more of a performer than I am. But yeah, I really even like now, to like, strut my stuff yeah. on the on the big stage. <laughs> but I would. You're love, great though. I know. I'm fine. I like. I you know I land on my feet but you know I have I'm like very nervous beforehand Mm -hmm. I mean I'm sure you are too it's not uh, it's not like the most pleasant experience to go out on a stage right um but the roar of the crowd yeah the roar of the crowd yeah they're like (laughs) get the fuck off the stage um but I'm nostalgic for it because I know we haven't done one in such a long time I'm trying the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm trying to manifest it with God you see yes that's exactly that's what I'm yeah. talking about my SNL yeah. hosting appearance well I was so desperate to go to the movies mm-hmm. the other day I went to go see um because I moved right by film form yeah. I went to go see state funeral uh-huh. that like two hour long documentary about Stalin's funeral because it's the only thing I haven't heard of this this sounds interesting I mean it it kind of isn't it's really I mean it is and it's kind of relaxing because it's really long and Uh like drawn out um it's interesting you would probably i mean not that you have like you have a baby yeah so you don't have time to go watch a two hour long documentary about Stalin's funeral but um it really makes you f- make made you f- it was so boring that it made you feel like you were in the soviet union which was interesting nice yeah you know you like i just, was like wow this is so drawn on and endless yeah <laughs> it just slowly doze off yeah i took a little nap i woke up it was lots of like it's interesting to see it's all like real footage from the 50s or whatever and it's um all the slavic faces are nice to see and yeah it has it's well it's well made slavansky or morde morde yeah (laughs) like people crying and stuff and all the transmissions about like what a great leader stalin was and like yeah Yeah, no i love i love all those all, all the kind of like all the like the stories uh, from Stalin's deathbed where he was like suffocating, like choking to death and people like prematurely going like, I, you know, I want his spot and then you know, him like choking back up, like taking yeah. another breath. Well, de- death of Stalin is the superior Stalin's death movie. Definitely. I don't even, I haven't seen it. Oh my God. With Steve Buscemi. No, I haven't Oh my seen God. It. You have to watch it. Wait, who plays Beria? Um, I like forget. Bob Hoskins or it something? came out in like 2018 wait who does Steve Buscemi play you should watch it um, death of Stalin we can move on to Brunigate yeah. but I'm gonna google just... that shit yeah Brunigate who does Steve <laughs> Buscemi play though I'm like very curious uh, Khrushchev oh okay Beria is played by Simon Russell Beale okay. Jeffrey Tambor plays Malenkov <laughs> um it's like british yeah uh it's like was produ- it's like made in the uk so it's got like british actors in it but yeah um Buscemi's really good in it I'll you'll like it, it. It's, it's really funny yeah um it's like exactly what you were describing where he's like reanimating and like <laughs> yeah and people are just like shitting on the floor and yeah stuff. yeah yeah they're like waiting for him to die with bated mm-hmm. breath um anyway uh, Bruneg Bruneg yeah I uh, say Bruneg Bruneg I should probably I ask think I don't know Bruneg Bruneg um friend of the pod and former guest mm-hmm. Liz Bruneg one of our first guests yeah. Liz Bruneg um uh, wrote an op-ed yeah for the New York Times that was called do you have the title I do it's called I became a mother at 25 and I'm not sorry I didn't wait um thought was uh well thoughts on the piece yeah i thought the piece was wonderful i thought it was very touching and i thought it was well written yes and it articulated um 
interesting information about <laughs> fertility trends mm-hmm. in America and like wrapped it up nicely with like her personal experiences mm-hmm. that were like touching. Yeah. Um, but I, um, I didn't read it until I saw people really like shitting their Freaking pants out, about it. Yeah. And it really seemed like it triggered people a lot. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, I don't mean this is in an insulting way, but it was really like a non-story. I think it was a perfectly fine and unremarkable article like that that was well written and thoughtful. I mean, unremarkable, mm. not as in bad, but as in like normal. Yeah. Um, she she talks about how um, uh, how all the conservative caterwauling over like the push for subsidized childcare um, is weird and because she talks about basically how you know conservatives are always going on about the country's declining birth rates etc but they um hate the thought of subsidizing policies that would make it mm-hmm. more viable for people to, yeah to give birth and therefore raise the birth rate right. and she goes into the kind of reg um racial and educational and location-based and class demographics of different groups of, right of birthing people we're calling them now chest feeders <laughs> i don't know what the people of reproductive birthing. experience <laughs> yeah. um and yeah and i think she touches on the fact the most important part of it i think she touches on the fact that it, she you know is unclear or it is unclear whether it's a pragmatic decision or or kind of like a um kind of selfish personal decision driving these not delays have, yeah not to have children yeah which is probably a mixture of both i think yeah it can be selfish and pragmatic yeah i mean and as she points out um in her home state of texas the median age of um women having their first child is like 25.7 or something yeah and so she's not even like that exceptionally young of a mother yes and to me this piece really felt kind of like a foil to a lot of like op-eds and personal essays that get published periodically about women who are like either happy that they had an abortion or like Mm -hmm. had children and like regretted it or like you know there's plenty of like people voicing their like weird distaste and dissatisfaction like personal experiences and for liz to articulate a very like normal and wholesome and like edifying one and for people to react with such vitriol really made me feel like twitter is just crazy so yeah. far gone well okay yeah and, and and the thing is like she wasn't being a condescending little bitch and rubbing it in that she was uh so young when she gave birth like the 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 title or, or kind of the way that the piece was billed yeah. is, is a little bit of a misrepresentation of what it really is um and I actually like commend her for being open about kind of the alienation and ambivalence you feel Mm -hmm. when you have a kid. Cause it's very lonely and alienating. Like you're surrounded by people who want to help, but they can't help meaningfully. Um, And like, you know, I want, I I would say that a lot of the backlash to this piece is truly like unfounded and disingenuous and based in the world in like the worst most catty most craven female social politics like they're just mm-hmm. jealous because i mean like let's face it liz Breunig is a beautiful young mother who seems mm-hmm. very devoted to her children and also has a very successful career yeah so she has it all and you know they're just jealous yeah or that's how it looks i know but i would say also the problem there is that no one actually has it all and I think like, you know, I'll get into this. I have a lot to say about this piece Great. and the, the reaction to it. Um, but I think that you can like, if you read the between the lines of this piece, you can see that Liz is articulating some very serious anxieties and insecurities she has about her position in the world. How so? I mean, I think that like, it's very hard to negotiate you know, and I don't want to dog on Liz because I do want to say that she was incredibly like helpful and supportive to me. Like the outfit that the baby wore coming back from the hospital came from Liz. Aww. She sent me a really sweet care package that was like very like useful and thoughtful because she's yeah. been through it and, you know, was kind of like there for me when she doesn't really know me and doesn't have to be, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like, 
I don't think that she'll take this the wrong way, but I think that there is a fundamental incompatibility in being a mother and being a Christian with being like a public figure um, Mm. and a public figure who um, I think has some role in, you know, like you, like I think all of us are basically, you know, complicit to some extent in sexualizing ourselves on the internet Mm -hmm. and she's negotiating a very delicate balance of being kind of like i mean she's not an e-girl by any means but she is like a young attractive woman in the public eye she has a lot of simps and she is attractive Yeah. yeah yeah but that's you know it that is really an impossible position i know it's like white girl problems but you can't you can't be like you know navigating the yeah and i think like people are mad at her very often for for reasons that the you know they think they're mad at her for one reason but they're really mad at her for kind of like other well, reasons. triggers yeah i think the yeah people are triggered in a larger way by her sort of like idyllic life yeah and her public facing persona as you said yeah, but I guarantee you, and this is like, again, no judgment on Liz and not an insult to her, but I guarantee you her, your, you, her private life is nothing like her public image. I mean, it is to some extent, but it deviates. I mean, like having kids is a very uh, consuming and frustrating experience. Yeah. It really is. Like, yeah, it definitely seems like it sucks a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, yeah. And I think like, that's the sort of I mean the thing is that um as I've said before like I think it's very dehumanizing to be jealous of people all of us have feelings of jealousy sometimes but it the best policy is when you start having them you should try your hardest to not entertain them because you never know what somebody's life is like right. you know and you know again it, you I don't know, you certainly people don't. can't even own up to being jealous of her that's the problem yeah i mean you they, know, they just they do, very they clearly do. are yeah but yeah um there's a lot of like kind of issues with this piece i mean number one as you pointed out you know having kids at 25 is not that young right like my mom had me when she was 21 yeah exactly <laughs> my mom had me when she was like 31 and she right. was on the very old side in the soviet union even my parents were like the last of their friends i think to have, really to have kids yeah well yeah my yeah my dad was 24 my mom was 21 yeah they're like that's very young for Incredibly now young. but yeah. yeah for in back then i think it was the norm 25 is young for the media class in which we all orbit it's not very young for the rest of the world and liz by the way acknowledges this in her piece yeah so or but, the, the country yeah the yeah whole, middle of median age is like 26 or something yeah but it's understandable how that alone might come off as condescending to people who as most people on social media do now only read the headline you know of course yeah because i doubt a lot of these people who are not reading it and read the piece or they read it in bad faith yeah the other second thing is like you can't be that shocked that this piece generated backlash because i think um the New York times is in the business of generating backlash. And I think they, they hired Liz knowing full well that she would generate backlash Mm -hmm. for them. Right. And everybody knows this is like part of the package. Well, she went to the Atlantic today. I saw. Oh yeah. So (laughs) well, good for her. Good for her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, the title was misleading and like designed sort of to, to trigger people. Yeah. I think, Especially, which also the, if they had read the piece or had read it in good faith, the, a big point she makes, yeah, is that it's like there's diminishing birth rates because people either can't afford to or like are not partnering in viable Mm -hmm. ways. And there's like, there's real social causes for why people aren't reproducing Mm -hmm. (laughs) as much as they ought to be. Um, But all of the like antinatalist kind of, projection and bolstering that happens around that is just justifying the economically precarious situations yeah. people are already in yeah i mean again it's it's um a- another instance of radical posturing marching in lockstep again mm-hmm. it's always mm-hmm. i mean like n- 10 times out of 10 that's what it is um and then you know the third thing is like liz like any problematic woman 
uh-huh. who's like extremely online, brings out the deranged freaks mm-hmm. in droves, which makes any criticism, excuse me, it makes any criticism of her look deranged, you know, by association. Right. And there was a lot of deranged freaks. Like all the feminists came out for this one. Mm-hmm. Like Marco, Filipovic, Doyle. Do- the feminist formerly yeah. known as Sadie Doyle. Yeah. Um, who Marianne called out for their misogynistic attack, yeah. on, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, and who apparently won't change his handle from his dead name, Sadie Doyle, because um, he'll lose his blue check. Wait, really? Wait, That's if you what cha- I heard as we were saying. Wait, but if you change your name in an existing account, you'll lose your blue check? Really? Like, the display name is like jude whatever doyle their name but then the at is still sadie doyle because i think it's i don't think they can change it yeah whatever (laughs) um what is that person's a psycho and no one should take anything they have to say seriously yeah i mean that tweet was psychotic i'll pull it up it was deranged the other thing so i mean ultimately yeah, I didn't feel as a childless woman. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, There's still time. I know, but like, whatever. I'm like, yeah, in my 30s. You're 23. Yeah. I'm 23, and like, I don't know if I'm gonna be ready in like two years. To have again. <laughs> um, no, but whatever. I'm like, in, I'm childless. I was like, and I know women who have kids who read the piece and felt kind of triggered by it, honestly. <laughs> Wait, why? Just because I think she does inspire these. Um, I wasn't triggered by it because I, I don't know. I definitely don't wish I had a kid Yeah, when I was 25. I don't think I would have been a fit mother. I think Liz Brunig was an incredibly fit mother at her age. She seems wise beyond her years and incredibly like, yeah, devoted and wholesome and like has a media career and stuff. And when I was 25, I was not, I truly was not in any position, not just economically, but like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in all aspects of my life to have a baby yeah same i was unwell <laughs> yeah um but yeah but then i saw yeah i saw people that saying she was like trying to discourage women from having abortions which you know good <laughs> i know yeah like what <laughs> what yeah i as a fundamentally pro-choice person, I'm just so shocked by the the zeal and glee with which people advocate for abortions. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, I'm a total pogliaite here. It's whether you agree with abortions or not, it's a totally ethical issue. Like, make no mistake, you are taking a life, you know? Yeah. Like, absolutely. Um, this 100%. becomes even more apparent once you actually have a child and then you have to, you know, really like look at yourself in the mirror, like very guiltily. Um, experience that guilt let it flow through your body and remember that like you know this child is here because the you know other few aren't you know it's really <laughs> fucked up like you know i yeah. have i i really have like this feeling like my the people on the internet who by the way also say deranged and cruel things about me that are completely disproportionate Same, to anything dude. i've said I know. they'll never hate me as much as i hate myself so i'll always have the upper hand because i did you know a bad thing and like here's um jude doyle the greatest <sighs> trick the devil ever pulled was convincing this woman that it was a tremendous personal achievement to be repeatedly knocked up by an internet troll she met in high school that is just such an ugly, fucked up, disgusting, disgusting thing. thing to say. Yeah, about, um, you know, a woman that you who don't know a, that's like a 2D effigy to you. Who wrote a totally benign fucking op-ed about how she's happy she had children. Yeah. <laughs> psycho well no but this is the thing this is why i say you shouldn't be jealous of of liz because you shouldn't be jealous of anyone because liz is i think she does not regret children and i think she's happy she had them but she is expressing um through the the you know through the, between the lines a certain ambivalence about her position in the world which like um, is very scary and honest and people completely miss that in, in favor of like dunking on her for like you know we'll say more about this 
ambivalence i guess yeah but like well before i get to that i think it's Mm. funny because all of these feminists like amanda marco and jill filipovic and uh jude formerly sadie doyle who by the way all of them have them block have me blocked so i have to like ask people in group chats to screen cap their tweets to prepare for this episode every single person who was like being quote tweeted in response to brunette gay was had me blocked and i had to like dm it to my like (laughs) my (laughs) private twitter account to look at it i was just like yeah i was like um well you know not my problem problem solved i guess i don't have to talk about this topic um yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I say this because I'm in a similar boat. Like, I mean, your instinct as a mother is to um, be private and protective. Like, I'm never going to pimp my child out the way that I pimp myself out. But there's no way in hell that me pimping myself out will not have consequences for my child. You see what I'm saying? And like, no, but we're all we're all whores. We're all whores and exhibitionists. We all. I mean, not just in that way. I mean, just in general. Like, yeah. Even if you were working at like a factory, you'd be pimping yourself out. Yeah, you know? but it's there's like there's no, no dignity to be found. I don't know. I think there. I think there is through telling the truth and being honest about these things. There really is, and mm-hmm. like, um. You know, I think that's what we try to do, which is uh, why, contrary to uh, the claims of our haters, we do have a very large and broad a female listenership. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Course. A listenership of, of broads. Course. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely. But I mean, in even in that, like, the what we're subjected to on the internet is undignified and it is that way i think for everyone not just like podcasters or media figures i think everyone is sort of stuck in this like uh like twitter this is what i mean about like the response to liz's article was just like twitter is a sick place yes (laughs) and it's made some people so insane that they've like transitioned (laughs) yeah (laughs) like jude you mean yeah well the irony is that like Jude, like Amanda, like Jill, made their name by being one of these kind of like feminists who cried misogyny. Mm-hmm. And so does Jude now look in the mirror after having transitioned t- into a man and like slap himself because he's the misogynist, like he became the misogynist. Yeah. He wanted to. I uh, know. Yeah. <laughs> like there's some like weird perverted irony in that the self-loathing is yeah like becoming self-aware yeah and the trouble is like we're incent we're all whores and exhibitionists and we're incentivized every step of the way and we're all too weak to step away and like um you know it turns out uh having kids and having the faith does not prevent you from being a twitter addict i mean it's very sad like a cry- i'm not well this- don't you think she has to use twitter on some level no no i'm not even talking about liz i'm talking about like all of us like just like you know like i've scaled back my usage out of um necessity but out of like also desire but we you know we're all kind of addicted to social media in a way yeah but for someone who's trying to have a media career they sort of depend on it like it's easy like we can kind of step away from social media now but like five six years ago yeah um when we were like building our followings that like you know we segued into like a podcasting audience Mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been as easy for us to just like log off you know there is like real incent material incentive to like posting until there until there isn't yeah no i i get that but like and i think for liz like yeah she's that's she's that's her career Yeah, no, I know. But I I think that there's also part of her that I see and there's part of all of us that is a little over invested. And, you know, there's a vast distance between your private life as a mother versus your public persona as Mm -hmm. a mother. Yeah. Um, So, you know, again, Marianne Williamson, God bless her heart, can talk all she wants about misogyny. And she's right. I mean, Marianne Williamson is like, she's a frustrating figure because she's like 97% right at all times, but like she doesn't nail the 3% Um, (laughs) because you know, yeah, we can talk about misogyny and the patriarchy and the kind of um, unrealistic standards for women, um, how they're, they're, they'll, they're mad at us because of our body counts and our BMIs and like (laughs) what we post on the internet, but we opted into the system. We did it to ourselves to some extent. Yeah. And like, you know, um, 
I've maybe it's because I've had a kid or I've had too much wine, but it's like very frustrating to like sit back and and witness this and like at a you know just like also selfishly to be called like a cruel or or not compassionate person because this is the gospel that I've been singing since day one. It's not meant to uh, insult or alienate women. It's meant to tell them that like you have the power and strength within you to like value yourself on your own terms without being sure you know a social media addict or like a drama addict or something (laughs) like that um yeah i hear that and i think this can like it concerns all of us my life has improved drastically since like just shit posting less and just being engaged with social media less honestly yeah of course like do you feel like more kind of like plugged into reality or like tethered I mean, to reality, reality sucks too it, it's not like yeah, it it's does. a drastic improvement but it's just yeah my my the quality of my days and my thoughts are better <laughs> yeah you've attained some clarity or whatever yeah. um yeah and i mean you know i remember I'm when not, like upset about something camp bot said yeah to me, you know god bless him yeah like I can't that's there's just no reason why that should be like I wish him the best <laughs> jealousy is a disease honey. jealousy is a disease bitch wait I actually haven't thought about camp bot in months because he blocked me so blocked I just don't too, see his yeah. tweets anymore yeah. um or maybe I maybe I blocked him I don't remember should I tell the fucked up and crazy camp bot story about how we were he like was scrapping with me on twitter and then he texted me and I explained to him that I was like about to give birth at any point, and he said that I was quote a boring loser over text. Hell yeah! It was like I I couldn't even be mad. I thought it was like so cute and yeah. amusing. I just told him I wish him the best. I really do. Truly, same. I think you know, there's something always redeemable about him for me, even though he's like a fat bully. I know he's a troll yeah. and I respect as, as you know, a recovering extremely online person. Yeah. I'll always, I'll always respect like posters. Do you, do you ever have the urge to shit post? Yeah, totally. Me too. Completely. Yeah. But I'm trying to practice like mindfulness about yeah. it and be like, okay, why are you, why do you want to yeah. say this stuff? So even though you know it's going to like make people mad. People and, like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, because it's true. But then like an even more mature part of me is like, but it's okay. You can just let it go. Yeah. It's, it doesn't matter. You have to train, you have to like reprogram yourself. I you had the urge the high to road. ship post today and mm. I vicariously ship posted because I mm-hmm. retweeted a tweet from some guy who was like, Israel, this Palestine, that this is rightful Roman land. And I was like, yeah, so it's <laughs> a retarded joke, but <laughs> yeah, I saw one that was like two state solution, like two Palestine seems like overkill, but whatever y'all want <laughs> <laughs> that I, that I enjoyed. Um, but yeah, no, I remember like several months ago when Amrata wrote that very viral essay about reclaiming her image mm-hmm. from like rapacious paparazzi and rapey photographers. And, you know, I don't want to dog on her either because I find her to be also a beautiful and kind and thoughtful young mother negotiating motherhood for the first time. Yeah. But what went unsaid in that essay and what goes unsaid in the discourse in general is that you bought into this. And to any woman online, anytime you publish your image you are inviting negative attention as well as positive attention. That's not a value judgment. That's like a descriptive statement. Mm -hmm. Like that's the reality. And it doesn't have, it's not the patriarchy or misogynists. It's just like, you can't control or contain other people's organic reaction. It is misogyny. It's just that misogyny is like a natural impulse that like courses through people when they, are subjected to or experience things that trigger them on like a very usually like this Freudian yeah. early childhood, like visceral level and being a woman makes you very charged for a lot of people. Yes. And so, yeah, I think, I think it is misogyny, but it's not patriarchy, but yeah, it is it's misogyny. Not, it's not it's systemic. Like you, but you have to take responsibility for triggering like misogynistic impulses in people because yeah. they're going to happen regardless because they're kind of like primordial and they're kind of like, yeah, com- they're kind of muddy and complicated. And like, that's what the internet is. It's this like kind of cesspool for people's like 
weird like getting their like let out yeah expressing their id weirdo shit like of course but you yeah you can't legislate people's kind of intuitive organic reactions to certain things Mm -hmm. um we you know i think it's wrong and absurd to as some people have proposed that we have to like change the expectations of a vast majority of people (laughs) to cater to i mean this is the same problem as the fat acceptance movement right Mm -hmm. like the the bar has to be customized to uh, to suit everyone yeah so that it suits no one in the end right and like i mean there's it's incredibly unfortunate that people out there are cruel to fat people or think less of them or look down on them um and i think we should all be vigilant against our like impulses in that way if you have them yeah you know but it's also there's like a reason why and it's just deviation from a norm that like inspires contempt you know yeah well and that's the thing i mean people you'll not you'll be you'll do better like eradicating obesity than eradicating people's like impulses yeah or or they're kind of normative stigmas people talk a big game about like this word stigma because it's automatically seen as something bad Mm -hmm. and it's like well stigmas exist for a reason just like stereotypes exist Mm -hmm. for a reason just like taboos yeah they have you know a basis and like you know it's been normalized now for women to post breastfeeding pictures of themselves on the internet um liz got into some trouble for that as well and you know my feeling about it that's insane but go ahead what's insane i I, that to me is a perfect example of something that is so profoundly triggering to people because weaning yeah is people's first trauma not to sound like too much of like a fucking (laughs) psychology freudian like asshole but like weaning is your first trauma that's the first like the breast is the first thing that babies feel an ambivalence towards Mm -hmm. that they like when they have the breast they feel good when the breast is gone they feel bad yeah so that that's like in their like barely formed psyches Mm -hmm breastfeeding is like an incredibly charged thing and weaning is traumatic for everyone you know and i'm using trauma just also in a descriptive way not in like a loaded way but like being weaned is a traumatic early childhood experience that everyone like goes through basically if they're breastfed and so seeing images of people breastfeeding i think like triggers some response in like people's deep subconscious well and men i think it meant it makes men, men horny and then hostile because you know they they resent it makes me kind of horny and hostile honestly. yeah i make i'm like oh like the mommy milky like yeah. yeah like i do kind of regress a little bit when i see like breastfeeding pics like a you know yeah i mean but okay here's the thing between us girls when i see a photo of a woman breastfeeding i think that it's beautiful and wholesome it doesn't you bother do? me i think like if if somebody sent me a picture of themselves breastfeeding it wouldn't be any sort of, I wouldn't feel any type of way. It wouldn't be like a provocation. But when you put that image out on the internet, internet, you have to be aware that some people will react to it negatively because Mm -hmm. they will see it as a kind of female equivalent of like Anthony Weiner propping his baby (laughs) next to his boner, because it is kind of sexually provocative on some level. Of course. And of course people are legitimately outraged. It's not a totally kind of like unwarranted far-fetched thing for people to be outraged at, at the thought of somebody over sexualizing themselves by using their child as like a prop or a proxy mm-hmm. i mean that's obviously the reaction there and I, here's my thing i think that if you're up front about the fact that you enjoy your vanity by all means i actually think there's nothing wrong with it um but you have to be very honest with yourself that that encompasses good and bad consequences plenty of people will um jump to celebrate you and call you beautiful and like stunning and a goddess and a queen. And then there's going to be another group of people who um, say the the worst, most foul things Mm -hmm. and you really can't be mad at it. I mean, I think you you have have the right to be upset. You have to let it just kind of roll off of you because it's so irrelevant ultimately. Yeah. But just like, you know, so we're clear you as a, as a, uh, um, social media using birthing person have signed up for it to some extent and Mm -hmm. you can't be shocked or surprised when it happens when do you think you'll dox your baby 
what do you mean like post a picture of his face i i don't think i'm gonna do that I, you don't think you'll ever post a picture no of his you know face. yeah he can do it when he's like 18 or something really i don't want to do that just that's like a personal decision but i think that like um I, he has you know he's a separate autonomous human being and like I, he like doesn't you know because i see a lot of monk young mothers obscuring the baby's face mm-hmm. um until they don't yeah and that point to me seems a little like arbitrary mm-hmm. and i think at a certain point i don't know i totally respect whatever you do obviously yeah but i think at a certain point there's a way in which you know you're just using social media as an extension of your life in like a mm-hmm. casual way yeah where it would be like weirder to obscure your kid's face than to not post it you know yeah. i think it's just something that happens very very naturally organically, organically. Yeah. And i think so i think if I, you know i don't know yeah i just i don't know i feel like a profound visceral misgiving at the thought of putting i completely get my that. child's face on the mm-hmm. internet um because there are, you know, people pedophiles. Because your baby's so hot. Yeah, <laughs> such a hottie. Because um, your baby's so hot. Um, but I mean, listen, I peaked when I was five, so it makes sense that my <laughs> baby is peaking at this age. Um, I was like the That's sexiest I'll ever be. You're as peaking a f- now. I know, but I was, I was them. a very sexy five-year-old. Just you look gorgeous. Thank you. You look incredibly. People have been saying it. Yeah, it's well, it's because pregnancy Everyone's talking about releases it. um certain hormones that, that that are literally like facial feminization it, no way yeah they you, you're like feminized through wow. pregnancy because you get you have like estrogen more estrogen and then it goes away after three months and you go back to your then like you ha- like you're like haggard cool. but also more anxious yeah um but like <laughs> yeah i don't know i mean you know you can't ask other people in mass to set aside again their natural reactions Mm -hmm. which may or may not be flattering or pleasant you know that sort of thing um yeah the problem is it's a feature not a bug of of social media yeah the problem is always is social media that's what it's the platform boils down to um but yeah i do think that people on the whole are just very misguidedly jealous of liz but liz is not even um You know, I think Marianne Williamson was absolutely right to the extent that Liz to them is not a real person. Yeah. She's just a vessel for, yeah. Yeah. She's all of their like dash dreams or something. Yeah. (laughs) And of course, I have no love for these kind of like Gen X feminists that circle around her like vultures. Yeah. I don't actually think that, you know, that their claim is that Liz is trying to launder a pro-life stance or conservative talking points. Okay. Well, she is into the democratic discourse. She is pro-life and she has a right to do that. Yeah. So am I, (laughs) but I think she's more like trying to codify certain democratic talking points or whatever. Like she's not a conservative by any means. No, she has like a socialist bend to her, like, socially conservative sort of values yeah i'd say personally she has like socially conservative values but i don't think she's like i don't know discriminatory or like bigoted or anything like that yeah like her problem isn't that she's you know she's progressive you know politically yeah um i think by probably she also pisses people off because like kind of like on a surface level she doesn't conform she doesn't map onto any coordinates that they're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Right. Like her like stack of labels doesn't um, obtain. Um, the, you know, the other thing that I will say is that there's a tendency um, among women when they put certain things, when they, you know, put certain personal details about themselves online or put images of themselves online, they're basically in the business of, making themselves enviable whether they know it or not whether they'll cop to it or not there is kind of like an inner an ongoing competition uh between women online Mm, you think yeah totally i don't mean that also in any like mean or judgmental way but you have to like keep upping the ante and then the other thing is like at the same time those women want to be likable and i feel like being enviable and being likable are basically incompatible too right so there's like all these like 
again this is like very it's a sweet spot. inside baseball and white girl problems mm-hmm. but there's all these kind of tensions that and frictions that people won't talk about yeah. and so you get a very binary picture because it's either like yes queen express yourself you do you girl boss totally stays winning fine whatever to see you breastfeeding it's not a big deal at all it's not like triggering my early childhood traumas whatsoever <laughs> I think it's awesome but yeah i definitely don't feel like i was like deprived milk as an infant (laughs) like i'll never get enough milk and it's like kind of ruined my whole life but (laughs) you do you girl that rocks (laughs) i mean if if i'm being honest and again i'm not trying to be i have to like hedge everything because i don't want to like you know it's okay make anybody feel bad or you know alienated or whatever but part of this upping the ante again is that it's become normal for ordinary women who aren't like porn stars to post pictures of themselves breastfeeding, Mm -hmm. which again, I'm not judging these women personally, but I do think that that's a little bit weird on some level. I definitely, I think it's a little weird. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's not, I don't think they should be like, shunned or hidden away or there should be any like yes. shame or god forbid stigma around breastfeeding i think it's totally normal great but yeah, yeah i agree the like the impulse to post it does feel just yeah it doesn't it evades kind of categorization in a way that yeah makes people feel hostile yeah and i say this like again from a totally complicit position as a person who's going to post a breastfeeding video today to a video yeah, yeah. a it's latching like instruction squ- squirting <laughs> milk into the <laughs> the uh, iphone camera have you taken breastfeeding pics um no not like recreationally i my i actually my you doulas did a photo shoot. And, well, my, no no my no my doulas and lactation consultant I know ugh, I don't even want to talk about okay. my like private Never, baby we don't stuff have to. I was just wondering. Like, get mad at me, but breastfeeding because I know very, you won't post. But I'm wondering. Yeah, if no, you've I taken. won't. No, breastfeeding is very hard. No, the only breastfeeding pictures I have are very unflattering and unattractive. They are taken by like my doula and or my lactation consultant to help me with the latch. They're not sexy at all. I see. It's like me with my like. I'm very much looking forward to uh, my like cheesecloth full of cottage cheese to turn into like an empty ketchup packet because like breastfeeding is rough sorry that's a really gross oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i don't i don't even want to go there i guess yeah i don't, don't want to hear about it um <laughs> we can wrap we've done an hour and a half so we um can... do we have any other i think i hit all my brunig derangement syndrome marks yeah um, um, I'm a fan of, of, of Liz's generally, I think, I think, yeah, people just are hostile to like the goody two shoes, Christian mom thing. Yeah. Like the kind of wholesome homespun yeah. aesthetic. She's making elaborate meals and do it. She has it all. She's doing it all. Yeah. And that's, I mm. mean, I definitely wouldn't be that kind of mother. I think I'd be a good mom. I think you'd be a great mom. In a lot of ways, but I don't think I'd be like making like churros and like figuring out like zany cool recipes and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) I'd, yeah. But I'd have other strengths as a mom. Yeah. um, Like your impressive BMI. (laughs) Um, No, I think you would really like make a truly great mother um, as as many Russian women. I look forward to, yeah, having a baby. Yeah, I just think I, in a what, few years, what is, you know, what's demanded of a mother is um, patience and sanity. Yeah, um, and those are things that honestly take time to develop. Yeah, so that, in that way, I'm glad there's kind of a delay. Yeah, because the way bitches be acting in this country, yeah. I don't think they should be having kids when they're too young. Yeah, you know, and you know. The- <laughs> No, I mean, sure, no, definitely not. I mean, it also <laughs> takes all kinds. It depends on of, on the totally, on the person, of course, of course. Um, but yeah, I I think that, uh, but God has a plan for all of us. Yeah, you well, know, totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the other, I guess, the last thing I would say about the list thing is that, like, I object to the kind of disingenuous misguided furor over the fact that she didn't pencil in every type of 
kind of identity like the Jude Doyle sort of argument that yeah. she's not respond th- responding to every type of situation it's or an whatever. It's an op-ed. It's, it's an, an op-ed. Opinion. She's writing about her experience, right? Exactly. Um, and that's but a bigger that's problem. The intolerance for any kind. Like, it seems like the more normal the perspective, the more intolerant people are of it. Because if she had written a piece that was like, I'm glad I had three abortions yeah (laughs) people would be like celebrating it i'm like queen abortions are rad you know but um um, expressing like a totally kind of moderate mm, like normal it's normative experience yeah of having a baby at like a pretty normal age even in america well that's the other issue it's like certain kind of like the normative also like stigma normativity exists for a reason because things certain things that are radical are only radical because they're confined to the edges to the exactly. extremities once those things be- become mainstream um society becomes decadent and pathological yes. um and you know that's a problem in a nutshell like with like wokeism or whatever it's like those people they're mad at you uh-huh. um when when you don't pay attention because to them indifference equals oppression um but they're also mad at you when you engage with them because engagement equals like obsession right so you can't win there's like it's a it's a no win situation the only way you can win is like by not playing the game damn yeah at any rate i wish liz the best i i uh wish her much luck in triggering the wokes (laughs) at her new outlet yeah I think maybe that'll be a better editorial fit because the New York Times um, really launders in this kind of like bad face. Yeah. Journalist editorialism. Yeah. And I hope, you know, that as women, we can be honest as women, with our, as women we can be honest with ourselves mm-hmm. because that's where feminism actually stands a fighting chance being honest about your desires yeah as like a movement for equality not equity that disgusting financial buzzword (laughs) the biden administration (laughs) is fond of using see you in hell see you in hell especially women (laughs) 